Dan Zef. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see everyone having a good time today. Yeah, great. Um, I'm going to do the shameless thing that happens when you follow um, speakers who are as good as the uh, previous uh, speakers, which is to um, use my family as a way of pleading to your heart. Um, uh, my question today is, isn't the future already here? Eight-ish thoughts that might change everything you know. Um, but perhaps leave it reassuringly similar. Uh, I'm going to kick off with this dude. Uh, anyone know who he is? Yeah, it's my son. So this is my son, Noah. Um, and he is obviously the most important child in the world, uh, the only son, boy that exists anywhere. Um, and I am deeply excited, but also concerned about the effects of all this technology and all this change on not just my life, but his life as well. Uh, and I'm deeply sort of concerned that we might be sort of abdicating responsibility for making some pretty serious philosophical decisions on all of our behalves to basically a bunch of uh, guys with PhDs um, in maths who've become billionaires living in Silicon Valley. And I'm concerned that perhaps those may not be the people who are best qualified to decide how human history might be shaped. Um, but with that in mind, I wanted to ask um, you guys a few uh, questions to begin with. Does technology keep any of you awake at night? Um, it certainly does me. I, I've taken to having my phone underneath my pillow, which is not a popular move. Um, and I suppose the question is, should it really keep you awake at night? Um, another question, will a single technology totally overturn everything we know about brand, media, and marketing? What, is, what do people think? Yes? No? So my last kicker. So do you think we're going to see artificial intelligence in our lifetime? Quick poll. Um, Steve Jobs, um, who said a few intelligent things, um, and talks about you know, technology. You've got to start with the consumer experience and work back. Um, there's so many examples I could show that might sort of illustrate what artificial intelligence might be. But this is a terrific one, which is a movie called Her. Anyone see Her? Uh, and this is because it's really not about the technology, it's about what it's like for the human experience. Please wait as your operating system is initiated. Hello, I'm here. Hi. Hi, I'm Samantha. What's it like to be alive in that room right now? I wish I could put my arms around you. I wish I could touch you. Um, I was going to show the whole film and thereby get away with having to do any of the speech. It is wonderful. Um, it, the, the kicker is he falls in love with the, uh, with the computer, and the computer doesn't fall back in love with him. Um, as the other speakers have uh, talked about, um, our old brains can't comprehend this rate of change. And I wanted to try and give you an example of you know, what that might mean and, and, and make it real. So uh, I want you guys to take a look at this clock. Can everyone see the second hand moving? Right? Everyone can see the second hand moving. You can maybe see the minute hand moving, but can anyone actually see the hour hand moving? Of course not. We can't perceive it. And, but the truth is, the hour hand is moving, and as sure as darn it, that hour hand will reach 12 and then 1 o'clock. Human beings are incapable of understanding long time, long history. We can deal in days, minutes, maybe years, maybe decades, millennia, forget it. Hundreds of thousands of years, really forget it. Um, here's uh, Richard Dawkins uh, giving some idea about that. You can't go by common sense. If we could do things by common sense, we wouldn't need physicists. <laughs> I mean, well, common sense, of course, comes from what was necessary for our brains to survive in the Pleistocene of Africa. They, so they had to survive. They had to know how to catch a buffalo and how to find a waterhole and how to climb a tree when being pursued by a lion or something. Our brains were never shaped by natural selection to understand either quantum mechanics, the theory of the very small, or uh, relativity, the theory of the, of the very fast. And it's actually a, an astonishing compliment to the human brain that at least some humans are capable of understanding. <laughs> so a lot of common sense, a lot of things that we think should make sense don't make sense. Um, because we're just not designed that way. And I think it's very easy to look at sort of some of the things that Jason was talking about and thinking about this is like tomorrow, 
or even in 100 years, but even if it's in 10,000 years, that's compared to the history of human beings, but a blink of an eye in our history, because we've been around for an awfully long time. Um, but I'm hoping to maybe reassure you that actually, in my opinion, whilst there is all this change, there are a lot of things which don't change. My day-to-day -day job is telling stories. I help brands tell their story a lot. And there's one thing that I believe in fundamentally, which is if you tell me a fact, I'll learn. Uh, tell me a truth, I will believe. But tell me a story, and it will live in my heart forever. Um, and so the first thought I want everyone to sort of get their heads around is stories aren't just a way of expressing what we're talking about. They're not just an ex a way of explaining what has happened. They are how we make sense of the world. They are embedded deep into our physiology as a means for making sense of the world, comprehending the world, and shaping them. Stories aren't just the things that we tell, they also shape us. And they are the best way to make sense of what is happening around us, and a much better way than sometimes reading these very dreary business books that often put me to sleep. Um, and we've been doing it since time in Memorian. Um, this is from uh, one of the oldest uh, drawings we know of in, in a cave in France. Um, and I'm pretty sure that pretty soon after this uh, cave drawing was written, the first brand manager was created um, with his own distinct sort of uh, uh, ideas around what kind of buffaloes should be. Um, the Egyptians knew a thing or two about uh, storytelling um, and created brilliant ways of articulating that. Um, Europeans are kind of proud of uh, the Gutenberg Bible, the first mass-printed book which popularized um, a, a new form of uh, belief. And bring it a bit more up to date, this, to my knowledge, I think is the first piece of uh, branded video entertainment. This is for uh, the Unilever company. Anyone here from Unilever? There you go. Feel very proud. This was created in 1896 it is as a partnership between the new innovators, the Lumiere brothers, and Lever Brothers, and they created branded content using the latest in technology, which was uh, celluloid film, to tell the story of sunlight. Um, bring it right up to date, and we're still telling stories, and the great guys from Dove told such a brilliant one with uh, sketches, um, and it changed the world. I think what is most surprising about this story isn't the fact that you know, stories are still part of our world. What's most surprising to me, in some ways, is that linear stories persist. I mean, we've had interactivity and nonlinear communications around for long enough now, and everyone sort of got excited. I remember CD-ROMs and interactive things. Anyone remember those CD-ROMs that took forever to load? But for some reasons, we're continuing to love linear stories. And I'm actually going to uh, disagree a little bit with what someone else earlier said, because people always talk about attention deficit disorder and people having shorter attention spans. Well, the data says otherwise, and whilst people are consuming smaller and smaller chunks of media, we're also seeing people invest incredible time in long stories, which is where you get this incredible binge viewing and binging experiencing in places like Netflix. And you know, my, my wife has recently discovered this terrible show called Scandal. Anyone seen that? Please avoid it. It will ruin your life. Um, and it's no wonder, because as everyone's talking about, there's this thing called the amygdala. We're built this way. Uh, I'm going to reference uh, the genius Ray Kurzweil, who's just going to give a, a little bit of an introductor as to some of the physiology about this. I wrote a paper describing how I thought the brain worked, and I described it as a series of modules. Each module could do things with a pattern. It could learn a pattern, it could remember a pattern, it could implement a pattern. And these modules were organized in hierarchies, and we created that hierarchy with our own thinking. And a year and a half ago, I came out with the book, How to Create a Mind, which has the same thesis. But now there's a plethora of evidence. The amount of data we're getting about the brain from neuroscience is doubling every year. Spatial resolution of brain scanning of all types is doubling every year. Uh, we can now see inside a living brain and see individual interneural connections connecting in real time, firing in real time. We can see your brain create your thoughts. We can see your thoughts create your brain, which is really key to how it works. Um, and in fact, a lot of his research in terms of understanding how we think and how we shape the world taps right back into some really brain old, old brain function and will project us right into the future. So, you know, I believe that stories tap into our old brain function. They act as this heuristic, turning complex information into hierarchies of knowledge. Um, and that actually should sound somewhat familiar to us because isn't that what brands also do? They take very complex things, lots and lots of decisions that 
people have to make every day and create heuristics, shortcuts, as a way of understanding and making sense of the world. And in fact, I would, you know, I'd argue that a lot of what lots of our jobs are day to day is feeding those with signals, helping create those stories within the mind's eye so that our consumers can make better, more positive, more informed decisions more quickly. Um, so I asked, uh, I asked someone I know who is actually knows what he's talking about, unlike me, um, who's a guy who used to work at Unilever before he left, um, who's responsible for having sort of created uh, brands like Omo and Dirt is Good and things like uh, Dove and the campaign for Real Beauty. And here's uh, Simon Cliff's uh, comments about it. He says, brands only truly exist within the minds of our consumers. They're the assembled heuristic of all the stimuli we provide combined with those consumers' experiences. They're not static or constant, but amorphous and ever-changing. Hierarchies of knowledge, perception, experience, part and only part of which we as brand managers are constantly feeding. It is a complex world and one which we have to get much, much better at understanding what our role in as custodians of brands and, you know, and that very important job of what I think is making the world a bit better by giving consumers much more interesting, much more sort of helpful choice much more quickly. Um, but it's a bit baffling, really, because what are we supposed to do about it? Um, anyone know what this is? Anyone shout out? Sputnik. Sputnik was uh, launched um, into space in uh, somewhat 50 years ago. First um, a static communications device uh, beaming down to Earth. Um, but what's curious is that the communication satellite was first popularized not by a business journal, not by necessarily a scientist, really, but by a storyteller, by a fiction writer. It was a guy called Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and in fact, if you look at sort of the history of predictions in non-fiction compared to fiction, I would argue that fiction has a much better record. So I've got a quote here from Time magazine in 1996 on Apple. Apple is a chaotic mess without a strategic vision, and certainly no future. So you can see, if time can get it wrong, we all can. Um, and I actually think, I think that's no accident. Arthur C. Clarke has a wonderful quote. He says, the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. Um, so I'm going to lead you to another sort of fairly startling uh, suggestion. And part of it is because I'm incredibly lazy and I absolutely hate reading sort of those very sort of turgid, business books, because you know, all too often, I don't know if anyone's ever read Blink, which, you know, and the fundamental premise of Blink, which is by Malcolm Gladwell, is that you actually can sort of comprehend information in the blink of an eye, um, but he goes on for like 20 chapters to keep repeating that over and over again. Um, so I think that fiction is perhaps our only reliable predictor of the future. And it's through fiction, through stories, through writing, reading, retelling, and thinking about them, that we will not just think about what the world is going to be, but shape it and have a very accurate understanding of what it might be. It isn't just science fiction. It's us finding ways to understand what we might be and what those deep, important philosophical questions, which I assure you are not just science fiction. They are prescient today, and they perhaps are the single biggest challenge to what we understand as society. Um, and they are around the corner. They're around the corner because everyone's going on about Moore's Law. Things are happening very quickly. Next pop quiz. Everyone know who this is? Easy one. Steve Jobs, that's a sitter, right? Um, okay, great. Um, who is this then? Anyone? Very good. He's perhaps much more important than Steve Jobs because in many ways he's considered the father of modern computers. Um, he's also a British hero who, true to British tradition, having won the Second World War, by breaking the uh, codes um, through the first practical use of a, of a computer that he built and designed, um, Britain then went on to shame him and put him into obscurity and disregard him. He was only just rehabilitated last year. So Alan Turing's a brilliant, um, brilliant thinker, and he created what's probably the most famous test for artificial intelligence called the Turing test. Some of you might have heard, of, heard about it. And, it sort of, it looks a bit like this, when 30% of human interrogators are able to distinguish a machine from a human during, during a five-minute com keyboard conversation, you've made it. Artificial intelligence has happened. And guess what? It happened on the 7th of June. A bot called Eugene Grossman, which you can go online and interact with, 
passed the test. So there you go. We have it. End of presentation. Except for one thing. If you go online and actually try and interact with Eugene, you will very quickly discover that this isn't intelligence as you know it. In fact, it's kind of annoying and dumb. Um, actually, that might describe me, uh, according to my wife. Um, but the issue is, actually, it's very hard to define what intelligence really is. And in fact, if you talk to 20 experts, not one of them will be able to define it and agree it is a complex subject. Intelligence in of itself is, is a complex subject. And yet, this clock is ticking. So what are we going to do? Well, this is sort of a familiar version of the chart. I would strongly encourage you to disregard both axes, because the dates are made up. We don't know what's happening. But I just want to give you a, a, an impression. Um, the bottom is sort of computer intelligence, which didn't exist until the 1950s and started to get a bit smarter. The blue line at the bottom, uh, the, in the middle, is the average human, you know, human's intelligence. And then the, the top one is sort of, is sort of the exceptional human's intelligence, sort of the peak. Neither of these are very good, because of course, if it, when you're trying to measure intelligence for these human beings, also no one can agree. But let's agree that basically there's sort of a, there's a, there's a, there's a vague. Now, people talk about a singularity. And the singularity is the moment at which artificial machine intelligence crosses the Rubicon, crosses over human intelligence. Um, and if we believe in a model of exponential change, and there are people who don't, there are people who believe that it's more like an asymptote, that the closer it gets to human intelligence, it will start to tail off and never quite cross. Um, it's for you to think about whether that may or may not be true. But what's going to happen is, and as we're seeing, computers are catching up pretty fast. And at some point, they're going to cross the Rubicon, and they're going to cross both our intellig average intelligence, mine, and exceptional human intelligence, yours, um, and then far surpass us. And this creates a problem for a bunch of people who can't even agree what intelligence is. So I would argue that debates around the true definition of artificial intelligence will be rudely overtaken by its ubiquitous reality. It's pointless trying to even work out what this is, because honestly, by the time it happens, it'll all be 1 o'clock. We won't even see the hour hand move to 12. Um, now, as I was sort of considering this, you know, the problem is, who do you ask? You know, who is an expert? You know, is Ray Kurzweil going to tell me the truth? Well, he's under NDA. He won't. He works for a well-known company. Um, but I did happen to bump into someone randomly three weeks ago. It's absolutely true. At a private conference, um, a really nice bloke called Keith, who had every qualification to answer the question. Honestly, this is Keith. Does anyone know who Keith is? Oh, come on. There must be one of you. No? All right. Shall I give you a clue? He's a really big deal, by the way. I mean, you really ought to know who he is. No? Jason? Please? No. All right, Keith, I'll give you a clue. He works in there, or did. He, up until seven months ago, he was the, uh, he worked there. Any ideas? Hmm? Yeah, that is the NSA. Anyone know what the NSA is? National Security Agency. So Keith, up until about I don't know, eight months ago, was the director of the NSA in the States. The NSA is one of America's most secret organizations. Um, they have been in a little bit of trouble recently over something called PRISM, um, which is a, a, a computer that listens into what we're doing a little bit, metadata. Um, and I happened to be able to ask him these questions. I was at a conference. It was about a completely different subject. But I said, I'm giving a speech in Dubai. And this is completely off topic. But do you think we're going to see artificial intelligence in our time? And he answered me. I can't say every answer he gave, because it was one of those closed-door sessions. But I will tell you this. The look in his eyes was not one of a skeptic. And he said, the question one should be asking isn't, are we going to see it, but how are we going to use it to improve human potential? And more importantly, how will that sort of, what are the, what are the challenges that we can consider as we go forward? Um, and in fact, it is. One thing we should know about this place, whatever it is that's inside there, it's probably, what, a little bit better than what we've got in the Apple Store? Don't know how much better. No one can really know. So whether it's a little bit better or a lot better, who knows? And by the way, the NSA is one of a number of organizations that have lots of really cool stuff that they have a very good reason not to talk about, whether it's private institutions or public institutions. There's a very, very strong uh, imperative not to share 
the actual real developments in artificial intelligence, whether it's for patent information or for secrecy. Um, but I think we're already seeing tantalizing glimpses into our artificial intelligence future. Um, and I'm going to share sort of a, a couple of examples very quickly. Uh, this is a project called uh, Watson that was built by IBM. Um, and it was built, um, as any American uh, great venture will always do, to try and win at a game show. That was it, sort of, it's, it's trying to win at a game show called Jeopardy. And for the first time ever, it won. It beat the best of the best at Jeopardy. What's interesting about this is that Jeopardy isn't just general knowledge. It requires a real degree of intelligence to make that so. And it did so um, quite brilliantly. And it's now unbeatable. Uh, there's a very interesting company uh, called DeepMind, who I'll come back a little bit too later on, who are considered the fastest private innovators in the development of artificial intelligence. I'm going to get you guys to consider uh, what happened recently to them. Um, and actually, there's some kind of fun examples that we're starting to see in the real world. Uh, this was just recently released. With the help of iOS devices, we are bringing robotics and artificial intelligence technologies out of the lab and into people's lives. And we're starting by reinventing the way people play. Today, after over half a decade of working on Anki, we are so excited to give you a peek at our first product, Anki Drive. Now, we're going to start by sharing some of the technology under the hood. As we have these cars go through a few formations, realize that each of them is completely driving themselves. And our app is coordinating the entire experience over Bluetooth low energy. The cars can control their speed and they steer around the track by doing the same computations your brain does when you drive. They sense where they're located and they react to their surroundings, all in real time. Now let's do something interesting here. Brad, he's gonna tell these other cars to try to block Aiden. And just to be clear, none of this is choreographed. All we're doing is defining a new objective for each car, and they figure out the rest. Here, Aiden, he's using the exact same logic he was using before, sensing where he is and reacting to the other cars as he looks for an opening. Except now, these other guys are on a mission to try to block him. <laughs> so it's just a small example, and we're seeing these sort of tantalizing glimpses. I, don't, I wouldn't suggest for a second that it's true artificial intelligence. Um, we heard about the Nest thermostat. We have one at home. This has made a direct contribution to my marriage because I have that. Um, typical British uh, experience where I turn down the heating, my wife turns it up. Um, it's completely confused nest because it doesn't actually have any idea from our erratic behavior what the heat really should be. Um, we are starting to see incredible advances in search technology. If you look at how the search engine um, widely, uh, widely is, Google is changing. And in fact, Google is becoming much more than just a search engine. It's almost like a sort of a, a crystal ball of human intention. Um, because as a result, you can see what people are thinking based on their search. Um, I think we should be extremely interested in how search is advancing and how rapidly that's happening as well. And of course, we're seeing you know, technologies like Cortana, uh, Siri, and Google Now. Has anyone ever tried using Siri? Does it work for you? It's dodgy, but it's getting there, and it's starting to have this appearance of magic, um, this appearance of knowing what I need before I need or answering very complicated questions like, what's my gate number, without any context, and knowing what I mean is the flight I'm trying to make. And there's another very interesting sort of innovation called 23andMe. We actually did 23andMe at home. It, they do a genetic profile, your DNA profile, and then they will use that data and keep you up to date and cross-reference the big data in ways so that they can learn, based on who you are and how you are, what the future might bring for you. Um, what's interesting about 23andMe is, um, does anyone know who owns 23andMe or who's the founder of it is? No? Any idea who she's married to? Well, what's interesting about, I think, six of those examples, um, DeepMind, 23andMe, Nest, no? Google. And also, by the way, Ray Kurzweil, who is making search more intelligent. So honestly, this isn't science fiction. This isn't abstracted from absolute reality. No one underestimates Google. You shouldn't. Um, they are serious about this. And guess what? They're adding your genetic data to, to add to it. But actually, it might surprise you then to think that I actually think AI is going to improve our lives enormously. Um, it's going to transform a lot of what we understand incredibly for the better. I'm incredibly optimistic about it. I think it's amazing. I am the first person to adopt technology. Um, 
But of course, there might well be another side. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Yeah, that'll lift the hearts. Um, anyone know when that film was made, by the way? I think it's startling. That was made in 1968. It has hardly dated. It's visionary. It's quite brilliant. Um, and so I am slightly concerned. You know, I love this slide adaptation. The bad news is robots can do your job now. Good news is we're now hiring robot repair technicians. The worst news is we're working on robot fixing robots, and we do not anticipate any further good news. Um, but I thought I'd bring up what everyone understands and agrees would be a complete skeptic of this, before, unless you think I'm being sort of, you know, all doom and gloom. Everyone know who this guy is? Elon Musk, right? And, he, and no one can really accuse him of being sort of a skeptic. He he's a, loves and embraces technology. He said very recently, I don't think anyone realizes how quickly artificial intelligence is advancing, particularly if the machine is involved in recursive self-improvement and its utility function is something that's detrimental to humanity, then it will have a very bad effect. And whether this is in two years or in a thousand years is kind of immaterial. We won't know until it's probably too late. So this isn't about getting ready for tomorrow, because I don't believe we're going to have artificial intelligence tomorrow. In fact, I don't know when we are, and no one will. But I think what we need to be is mindful before we're overtaken by reality. Because if we're not mindful, and if we're not careful about who's making those decisions on our behalf, and what, those, what the ramifications of those might be, we may abdicate those decisions and those rules to a bunch of people who, whilst well-meaning, may not be qualified to make those big decisions, and certainly are not either sort of democratically um, or, or philosophically accountable to anyone. So what does this mean for all of us, right? I know three trades are three, three languages, fought three years, have three children, but what the, what, where does it leave us? Are we all going to be out of work, as uh, Nigel might sort of indicate? And I think, I don't think so. And I think because there's one thing which is terribly reassuring, which is that linear stories will persist in the new brains too. It is interesting that whilst we seemingly have gone through enormous technology change, this oral tradition of telling and retelling stories, which is as old as mankind sitting around a campfire, is essentially unchanged. And it's adapted itself to technology brilliantly. And it needs people to help be participant in that, be creative and orchestrate it. And I wanted to give you one example that I believe is near future. It isn't sort of a zillion miles away. Um, and so in this example, I think this is a piece of product placement from The Wake Walking Dead, which I think is one of the worst television shows ever created, um, and I wish it hadn't. Um, and it, in this example, you've got a, a, a fabulous Hyundai car. Now, at the moment, product placement or integration happens. It's quite sort of, uh, it, it's not terribly sort of clever. Um, but what's going to change is that the very fabric of stories um, through AI will be um, created on the fly based on who we are. And we, as marketeers and brands and media people, will have an enormously important role in orchestrating that. Um, AI gives us the ability to interpret billions of signals that include not just our profile, but how we're feeling and indeed responding in real time. So you can imagine the notion that a story doesn't just contain components to it based on what I know about you, but it's also adapting very significant parts of those as the story continues. You know, we see perhaps sort of glimpses of this through sort of retargeting, but this will happen through very sort of familiar linear narratives. And what's interesting is that to the audience, they will feel consistent and not unique to themselves, but of course, no two people may see the same story. And it leads us to a, perhaps an interesting brand quandary, which is this notion of responsive personalization. It's very possible that brands as we know them will be entirely shattered. If we have this enormous power as brand managers to adapt our brands, it, their messages, their stories, um, based on what we know you are both liking and thinking or liking, you could have the very real possibility of shaping our brands too much to them. Now, I personally believe that like, with great power comes the great opportunity for appalling marketing. 
Um, and I think it will be interesting to see how certain brands, which are lighthouse brands, fiercely sort of defy the trend and um, stick with their guns um, and stand for something consistent um, and immutable. Um, but I do believe that brand stories will seamlessly shape themselves into our experience, and we're going to be kind of the richer for it, and it will change everything, but also nothing. So I started, as I'll end, um, anyone know who this is then? No, well, we don't know what it is yet. No, it's my next one. My wife's pregnant right now, um, which, and um, in, in April or May, uh, I will be a father again, and I'm, I'm concerned because I think people don't understand the rate of change and its effect on us. And I think we have to start thinking about it now, but we shouldn't start thinking about it in ways which put us off or baffle us, but thinking about it in ways that actually make sense to us. So does technology keep you awake at night? Maybe it should. Um, will a single technology totally overturn everything we know about media marketing in the world? No, it won't. But it will change things, and I think what's interesting as, a, as an industry, we're pretty good at adaptation, we're pretty good at change, and we're pretty good at finding out the opportunities within that. You know, like those old Lever brothers, when they saw the Lumiere brothers demonstrating film, they were the first to understand its power. And will we see true artificial intelligence in our lifetime? I think I'll leave it to you to answer, because obviously I don't know. Uh, three last thoughts, otherwise I get thrown off. I think we should start using fiction as a predictor. Tell and Reese tell stories. Our new brains will only thirst for more, but finally, Please be mindful. It isn't enough just to assume that this sort of uh, elite in places like Silicon Valley have an omniscient notion of what is right and wrong for humanity. They don't. They're neither bad nor good. They're just human. And these are big, complex problems that we all need to consider. Thank you so much.